John 4, 17 and 21. Early on our marriage, uh, Lyndon, my marriage, we visited Orlando, Florida quite often. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when Southern Baptists had, had voted to veto Disney World, I went twice. So uh, uh, they deemed me not that good of a Southern Baptist. But uh, um, I said I wanted to move to Orlando, Florida, home of the amusement parks. You have Universal on one side and you have Disney World on the other. Uh, it was a dream come true, what I may call in my early years, heaven. And I told Linda, I said, I want to move to Orlando. I, I want to be there all the time and get into all the excitement there. And she said, honey, if we moved to Orlando, we'd be broke by the first year. Uh, we didn't move to Orlando. But I got tired of hearing myself say that all the time and saying, well, there's nothing in Illinois. Nothing to do, nothing much happened here. And I got tired of hearing myself say that, and I began to dig deep into the history of Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, and Missouri. And you may or may not know that all of the Western people that you have heard of actually came from Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, and Missouri. Matter of fact, you, no doubt you have heard the shootout of the O.K. Corral. The Earps were born in, Wyatt was born in Monmouth, Illinois, and the other boys uh, and, and Wyatt lived in Pella, Iowa. Oh, by the way, the Clancy's that you heard about in the shootout of the O.K. Corral, they're from Missouri. Jesse James from Kearney. Missouri and lived for a while in St. Joseph and I began to dig and there's more things that, that happened here than I realized. The Cherokee Trail of Tears you've heard of in the history books. Uh, actually some part of that happened in southern Illinois. They marched through southern Illinois. Um, the Potawatomi Trail of Death started in Tippecanoe, marched through Illinois uh, into Missouri and, and uh, stopped in Kansas. So as I began to dig, I began actually to be the person who would start our worship services with a greeting, and I would say, in a place not so far away. And most people didn't realize that that was taking place. As a matter of fact, uh, to, to move off of the Western heroes, we also had a man uh, by post. Uh, do you recognize that name? You may have had his cereal uh, today. Well, he lived in Springfield, grew up in Springfield, Illinois. So it began to become a world, almost an obsession of mine, to find out what really took place in Illinois. Now, that being mentioned, there was a villain by the name of Black Bart. Anybody ever heard of the name Black Bart? He actually was quite a clever man. And oh yeah, by the way, he grew up in Decatur, Illinois. Black Bart was a professional thief whose very name struck fear as he terrorized the Wells Fargo stage line. From San Francisco to New York, his name became synonymous with the danger of the frontier. Between 1875 and 1883, he robbed 29 different stagecoach crews. Amazingly, Bart did it all without firing a single shot. Because a hood hid his face, no victim ever saw his face. He never took a hostage and was never tra uh, trailed by a sheriff. Instead, Black Bart used fear to paralyze his victims. His sinister presence was enough to overwhelm the toughest stagecoach guard. And that comes from today in the Word, August 8th. 1992. Another thing that you may not know is that he did it all himself. And I mentioned that he was clever. What he would do is he would put out uh, stick figures that look like guns in the woods and he would rob the stagecoach by himself. But they all thought that they were being raided by uh, uh, gangsters at that time. 
but he struck fear in many people's lives who would take the stagecoach. If you found 1 John 4, 70 to 21, would you stand for the reading of God's word, please? It says this, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because he, as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God, whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time that we can come together and we can hear this message given by you, Lord. Uh, I, I pray that I am just simply the instrument in, in order to be able to deliver it. But Lord, we do need to love you, but we also need to love one another uh, that we may manifest your love to others around us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It says that love is perfected among us now when we think about perfect we think of things like without flaw or blemish without flaw or blemish there's not a one of us who is alive today who are, or who has ever been outside of jesus that is perfect that is without flaw or blemish it's interesting you read about noah you read about job and it says that they were blameless, which is the same word as this perfect. Now, how could they possibly be without sin when we know that everybody that isn't Jesus has sin in their life? As a matter of fact, Paul says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, there's a different word that we see here for perfect. We love in spite of our failures and our sins. Often I would use myself as an illustration, and I would say, if you think that I don't have flaws, that I don't have blemishes, just simply ask Linda. She will give you a long line of things that I have done wrong or that she has perceived as me doing wrong. I'm not perfect in that sense. But we didn't stop, excuse me, we didn't stop loving because we fell at it. We continue to love in spite of it. So what does this word perfect mean? Perfect means a completeness and a maturity in our love. Now, D stepped all over my, my sermon today speaking about a mature Christian, and I appreciate that because she gave me some, first of all, she gave me some confidence in what I was speaking is truly what God wanted us to hear today. But we need to be mature in our love for God and love for one another. Is your love complete? Is it mature? Now, we can't believe that a 19-year-old is complete and mature we expect a 19-year-old to do what? We expect a 19-year-old to be a 19-year-old. They're going to act like a 19-year-old. I have good friends who are the owners of Denny's, and they tell me all sorts of stories of how young students, how, how young people treat their workplace. For example, one of the things that, that I, I, I laugh at, basically because I could see myself doing this as well, calling in and saying, I'm sorry I won't be there today because my grandpa has passed away. Well, they know grandpa. Grandpa comes into Denny's every once in a while. And she says, I can't come in today because my grandpa has passed away. And the owner says, oh, my goodness, I'm so sorry that your grandpa has passed away. Please take all the time that you need to uh, visit with your family and grieve your 
Grandpa, well, what they didn't know was two hours later, Grandpa walks into Denny's. And the owner looks at the Grandpa and says, Are you feeling well? He goes, Yeah, I'm feeling fine. Why? And they explain, Because your granddaughter called in and said you had died. He said, I'm not dead. I, I remember when I worked at Motel 6 when I was a young student. And I didn't want to go to work that day, but I wanted to go out and have some fun. And so I thought that I would take some friends to Ponderosa. And I called in sick. And I said, I can't be there today. I, I, I'm sick. The next day as I walked into work, he said, if you're going to make up a story, you may want to hide your vehicle. You see, it was sitting at Ponderosa that night as I walk, drove by and clearly noticed that it was your vehicle that was there. Well, now as I have grown up, uh, it's kind of an expected thing. Why? Because a 19-year-old is going to do what a 19-year-old does. And they're just testing the water to see how far they can get. I expect a teenager to be a teenager. I expect a child to be a child. I, I generally have problems with that whenever someone who is supposed to be mature is acting like a 19-year-old. They haven't matured yet. I remember at, a, at the church that I came from, uh, a girl was sitting on the stage and just bawling her eyes out, and I thought something tragic had surely happened. And I sat down with her, and I talked to her, and I said, what in the world is going on? She said, my boyfriend just broke up with me. It's like the world had ended for her, and how tragic that was. Now, I tried not to laugh in front of her, but really what I thought was, honey, you'll have 20 boyfriends by the time you get married. You have a whole bunch of boyfriends, and this will become normal that they break up or you break up with them. But what is truly a blessing is when you see an 80-year-old who has matured in the faith that stands firm and says, this is a tragedy. This is something terrible that has happened but I know that God is faithful to me and that he will be by my side as I experience this tragedy. There's reward for the perfection of love. It says that there's boldness, not a brashness, but a confidence. I thank Sheila for the sermon illustration she gave, and now the sermon illustration comes out. Mason was stopped, I believe, today by the warden he thought that he was an adult out there hunting and he was uh the warden had stopped him to see his permit well the wonderful thing was that mason had a permit he had his uh, uh license to be able to go hunting he had nothing to hide because he was in the right relationship with the law and so i could see him standing there going it's right here i have it here you go look at it he can stand there with what he can stand there with confidence because he has the right relationship with the law that's the same way it is with god we don't have a reason to fear because love has conquered the fear and we can stand with confidence because we know jesus christ as our lord and savior I remember working at the airport. I worked at the Springfield Airport for seven years. And whenever I first started, I would be so scared because someone would inevitably show up five minutes late begging to get on the airplane. And I didn't know whether I could let that person on the airplane or not, so I went ahead and printed the boarding pass. Now, the problem was when they got there and saw the propeller spinning, they would break out the window trying to get on their plane. However, when I had worked there for three or four years, I would look at that person and say, I am sorry, you have shown up late. You are not allowed to get on the airplane. I got confidence because I became familiar with what the rule is. There are a lot of people who are afraid to share Jesus with people. They don't want to testify or, or be a witness for Jesus because the question is, what if I'm wrong? 
I know that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, but what if I'm wrong? I don't have that confidence in that. Yet when you walk with Jesus, when you walk with Jesus, you develop that confidence. You have that mature faith that you say, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is Lord and Savior, and he did this for me. I love that mature older women, and I had them in my life. And I've seen people who has bad mouth, Jesus, and they will rise up even bigger than what they are, and they'll say, oh, no, let me tell you about my Jesus. And then you talk about a sermon. But by the time she gets done, you are looking for an altar call. You need to come forward because you have thought the wrong thought about who Jesus is. But she just set me straight. Why? Because she has walked with him. She has confidence in him. She knows that he is Lord and Savior. And that's what love does. We can speak about Jesus because we have that confidence in him. But this takes time. Not when I was first saved, but as I have walked with him. Have you found him faithful in your life? It continues on in these verses and speaks about a judgment. There will be a judgment. There will be an accountability for us all. One day Jesus is coming back. And we will be amiss if we predict when he's coming back. But we know that he is coming back. When Jesus comes back, there will be a judgment. And we will be held accountable. When that time comes, those who know Jesus as Lord and Savior will truly be completed at that time. I'm not perfect now without spot or blemish. But when that time comes, I will be not because of who I am, but because of who He is. We begin here on this earth. As a matter of fact, I call earth heaven practice. We are come to worship and show our dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ and how that we love Him and, and we sing songs of, of praise to Him. But one day, we will be face to face with Him. We speak about salvation, and what many people think is that initial salvation, that experience. Some will say, I walk forward, and I ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And I love to hear stories of how that has happened, because not everybody walks forward after church and, and kneels down and, and prays. As a matter of fact, I heard of a man that was driving his tractor, plowing his field, and he felt he needed to get saved. So he stopped his tractor there and knelt down in the ground and asked the Lord to be his Savior. I've also heard stories of people who was living a, a drunken lifestyle in the streets and they knelt right down there at the street and asked the Lord to be their Lord and Savior. You may have heard the uh, uh, Dwight L. Moody. He began his church in Chicago, Illinois. And over the loudspeakers, they would play a, a story that you can still hear, I believe, on the Moody Network called Unshackled. He would play that over the loudspeaker in the city of Chicago, and many people came to the Lord because of playing that. There are many ways that people come to the Lord, but there's only one Jesus. We don't believe in many ways to get to heaven only through Jesus, as he has said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But when we have that experience, it doesn't end there. We go to the next level of save. We call that sanctification. It's to be set apart for God's service. He is completing me. He is working on me. He is telling me things. The Holy Spirit is working in my life and telling me things that I need to confess and I need to change in my life. And that's the second level of salvation. And then the third level of salvation is when we get home to heaven, we will be completed. We will be 
like he is. God is perfecting us. We haven't arrived yet, but he is perfecting us. I should be looking like Jesus every single day. I can't tell you how many people I have told who have felt defeated. Uh, they said, well, I thought that being asking the Lord to be my Savior, I would no longer sin, and so since I sinned, I guess I might as well just give up on this Jesus thing. And I often tell them it's not perfection without blemish, but it's progression. Am I better today than I was yesterday? Am I working on myself, allowing the Lord to work on me? Am I moving forward or am I moving back? We can do that because those who know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we have, what, we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit guides us in being completed. And without Jesus, there is fear. There is torment. There is a real place called hell. There are some who need to be afraid of God. I remember my mom, as I was growing up, I'd say, this fear of God, what, what is this? And she would say, it's respect, it's re reverence of God, and she was partly right. We should have reverence for God. But there should also be, if we are not His, there should be a fear of God. For one day there will be a wrath of God that we will experience if we do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We should be afraid of that because it leads to torment. They do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. However, those who do know Him have no need to be afraid. Why? Because the sin that we had, we have asked Jesus to take them. Somehow, I can't explain it fully, but somehow when God the Father looks upon us, He sees His Son, Jesus. And the unfortunate thing is when He sees Jesus, He sees us. He has taken our sin upon Himself. We were guilty. We were unworthy. But yet Jesus has made us worthy because of His blood. It says that there is no remission of sin without blood and Jesus died on the cross for us and God the Father sees Jesus in us we have love that is perfected in us many people have fears have phobias 12.5% of people have a phobia the United States citizens have a phobia of something phobias stop us in our tracks paralyze us from moving forward I've listed the top five phobias there's a social phobia fear of social interaction uh, and I'm going to murder these <laughs> words there is tyrophobia fear of cycle clusters there is thanatophobia fear of death nosophobia Fear of developing a disease. Arachnophobia, I know that one. Fear of spiders. Venophobia, fear of driving. Claustrophobia, fear of enclosed spaces. Acrophobia, fear of heights. Aerophobia, fear of flying. Ophidophobia, fear of snake, uh, snakes. Sinophobia, fear of dogs. Agoraphobia, fear of places that are difficult to uh, escape they are gripped by fear I heard this story back probably in 88 but it is really a good picture for us there was a man who walked into the prayer room in his university he walked in there to pray and he, as he entered he saw a big dragon on the wall great big shadow of a dragon and it gripped him with fear even though he could have said there's no such things as dragons and wiped it off but he was afraid of the dragon that was in the room 
until he inspected the room. And what he saw was there was a candle on the table, and some kid had laid his toy dragon next to it, and it was illuminating the wall shadow, and it was a big dragon. Now, some people would have said, just take the candle away. Take the light away. Oh, no, no, no. No, don't take the light away. Because you see, Jesus is the light. Take the dragon away. There are people who are afraid of demons and the devil and evil in itself. The only way to not be afraid of that is to bring the light into our lives. For Jesus is the light for us. Don't take the light away, but ask Jesus to conquer our fears. Love casts out fear. Judgment can be scary if we are not in the right relationship. When you don't know where you stand as far as Jesus and you goes. We had spoken about loss of salvation. I remember when I was a small child, every time there was a thunderstorm, I thought I had lost my salvation because a thunderstorm scared me, scared me terribly. And I'd run to Mama and I'd say, Mama, Mama, I must not be saved. Please help me go to Jesus. I remember when I was in college, I was afraid of that because it was snowing in October. Well, it snows in October from time to time. The problem was that we was allowing, or I was allowing circumstances in my life to dictate whether I was saved or not. And I must say that I wasn't saved as a child. I knew of Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus. Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, you will be saved. You know what the wonderful part about that verse is? If I ask myself, have I confessed that Jesus is Lord and made him Lord in my life? If I believe that Jesus is raised from the dead, I will be saved, and there's nothing that can take that away. I am saved. So when fear grips me in my life, I can go back to that verse and say, I have done that, and there's nothing that Satan can say to shake my ground in my faith because I know that I belong to Jesus. When fear comes into your life, and it will, remember whose you are. You are, you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And no longer do thunderstorms scare us. I remember many of you have probably driven to Effingham and have seen the big cross. And I love it from this direction because you wind a corner and there it is in your uh, in, in your in your windshield, the big cross. There was a big issue over the cross. The Ministerial Alliance of Effingham put that up, and I know one particular person who was instrumental in doing that. But there were people in Effingham that wanted to remove the cross. One particular man, because he said crosses scare him. Well, the cross in Effingham is huge, so it must really scare him. He said he's so afraid of crosses that he has to have a friend drive him to work and he hides himself in the trunk. And he wants to have the cross removed from Effingham. And I thought to myself, I, I hope it does scare him. I hope it scares the hell out of him. I don't mean that as his cuss word. Man, I'd love for him to know Jesus as Lord and Savior so much. And if that's going to scare him, Maybe that will also remind him of God's love for him. The cross still stands today. But love tells me whose I am. James Dobson, the starter of Focus on the Family, said as a child he was afraid of thunderstorms. And he would sleep in his mom and dad's room when a thunderstorm was predicted to come. And what he realized was when the lights went out and a thunderstorm would come, his dad would reach down his hand to him. And all his son knew was all he had to do was to lift up his hand to touch the hand of his dad and everything would be okay. 
Jesus is reaching down his hand to us if we will lift our prayers up to him. Have you felt the hand of God? How can we know he loves us? John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's love. God reached down his hand and said, I love you. The question is, do we love God? We know that. We've learned that since first grade Sunday school. But do we love God? It's real easy to gather together with a bunch of people who claim to be Christians who are also saying, I love God. I love Jesus. And then we show our love to Him by singing and listening and and participating in the worship service. But the test is not here. It is really easy to do that when you're in the midst of a bunch of people that are doing the same thing. The The challenge is out there. When people say, I don't believe in God, do we say, I do? I don't believe in the Jesus in the Scripture. Do you say, I do? In your workplace, do you show Jesus love in the school place do you show Jesus love or do you keep your mouth shut because you don't want to be shunned by your friends and your peers and people that are around you do the people that interact with you Monday through Saturday know that you are a follower of Jesus even when it's not popular remember this I remember sitting in college class, our missions class, and there was an admittance, and if I did this anywhere, there's probably many who would admit to this or or secretly admit to this. Pornography was running all over Lincoln Christian University. And the sin that pornography had caused in their life was coming out. Chuck Sackett, uh, well respected, even uh, I- including myself, said to him, said to the class, he said, I want you to know that before she looked good as a, centerf- a centerfold, she was somebody's baby. She was somebody's little girl. She was somebody's love of their life. And now she has done this to degrade herself. And it's sad. Nobody raises up in the morning when they're first starting out and says, I think I'll grow up to be an alcoholic. Nobody rises up early in their life and says, you know, my aspiration for my life is to be a druggie. Nobody raises up early in their life and says what I want to do is to be a prostitute nobody does that those aren't aspirations that they're trying to achieve what they have done is they have found that there is no way out that they are now a slave to that sin and the only thing that is controlling them is that alcohol is that drugs is that pleasure drive and they're crying out is there anybody who can show me that there is hope I've talked to a a, a school teacher several years ago I said what does the schools look at like today because really we're not allowed in school as adults we're not allowed in the school but teachers can go and I asked this teacher I said what does the schools look like what does the youth look like and this was probably seven years ago she said Doug it's the scariest thing that there ever was she said because every student looks like there is no hope there is no hope there is no real answers there is nothing and they're grasping trying to grasp onto something that isn't there and what I begin to see as I hear stories like this what I ask myself 
is where is the church? Where is the church showing their love to people to let them know there is hope? And if I had to be honest, now I'm not necessarily talking about this church, although I am. Too many times we're quiet. and We don't say much. I don't want people to know that I'm different than what they are. But we are. I don't want people to know that we are Christians because we will be outcasts of the world. And I always say, jokingly, but I always say, I wish somebody would have told me that before I became a Christian. Yeah, they have. Let me remind you of the verse. They will hate you because they have hated me first. But here's the golden nugget of that. We're not from this place. We have a heavenly home called by a heavenly father to share, to be an ambassador for the world. And the world is saying there is no hope because they have been failed many, many times. But what we can say is we know hope. It's not in us, but it's in him if you follow him. The answer isn't Donald Trump or Joe Biden. The answer isn't in our patriotism. The answer isn't in who's going to win the Super Bowl or the World Series. The answer is Jesus. Because he has overcome the world and allowed us to overcome the world as well as long as we follow him. And because I know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I can have confidence to know because he's not shaken from the throne, I don't have to be either. Because I am anchored to him, not my surroundings around me. Because they will fail every single time. This is a big election year. Guess what? In four years, we're going to have another big election year. And the next four years. And the next four years. And the next four years, as long as the Lord continues, and as long as the United States is a country. Why? Because we will experience failure after failure after failure because we put our trust in people and not in Jesus. Jesus has proven he is faithful and true. And I will put my trust in the sure thing, not in the rock. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time that we can come together.